affiliated with with EOS in any way or no? no. Just interested. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, pretty active on the Telegram groups. Uh, I used to be very involved with Steam, the Steam, yeah, the previous project. Mm -hmm. So when this project launched, um, I've, I've been I've been working on blocking projects since 2018. Uh, you're a, you're a, you're a veteran here. Uh, yeah. in, in this in this space, young yeah. industry, I guess in the veteran. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to create something similar to Steam back in 2015. Build on the uh, blockchain, didn't have a problem with that. Yeah, but now it's like, it's, 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 it's impossible to say Well, what about the Lightning Network? I mean, it's. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Some people are saying it works, some people. We, we talked about it on the yeah. And Lightning Network is not about the problem. Yeah, not the problem itself. To be honest, I don't know how, they, how that whole thing is going to work. Um, it just seems like a, it's a lot of truth we have to Yeah, I mean, the, the way that I understand Lightroom is that you have to pay to start a node and then you have to pay to turn off mode. Or, yeah, so. That's It's too complicated. Like, developing a blockchain is way it's just like, like do the cycle layer stuff. Yeah. We're 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 kind of looking at looking into doing like some initial chain and off chain transactions and then resynchronizing the master blockchain. Yeah. So that's a lot of hoops to jump. That's a lot of hoops to jump through. Well, um, we were taking a look at IOTA. Because uh, one of our advisors in our company is Pelin from the IOTA Foundation. Okay. Um, but even even so, like, IOTA is like that mistress that you kind of want to get with, but you're not allowed to because then she doesn't work or something like that. <laughs> yeah, like, so, so so far they've had some they've had some issues with IOTA and like it's just like okay, so the proof of concept is there, but they can't get the, the yeah. software working. So we're we want them, but. We think that it might be some other solution. I thought I almost was only like the thing. Yeah, 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 it is. But it's like you know, you can you can you could structure it for like a you know, transaction thing. If you do some off chain entangles from network, I don't know. Like, I'm, 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 not, I'm not I'm not I'm not a programmer, uh, but. We understand it to the point where it's like, okay, this could work. But what we need right now, like we're in the middle of our pre so we're raising uh, about 1.75 million US dollars so that we can hire a CTO and get them in. And then they can do the whole system architecture setup. Right now, are you thinking of building on IOTA? We'd like to. Well, well I'd stay away from that because I'd imagine, um, or I heard it, I always in the blockchain and use like a different type of technology, and it seems like it's really, really difficult. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so what it is is uh, they call it a tangle, but it's basically a atomic swap sort of thing. Uh, yeah. so, uh, it sounds cool, but uh, yeah, it seems like really, really complicated. Yeah, but, but I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be pure blockchain, at least not from our standpoint. Well, that's true. That's true. Using blockchain where it matters. That that's for us. That's, that's uh, where it comes in. So so what we're thinking of is having like a master ledger of the transactions that every day or every two hours that we back up. Also, for example, the Bitcoin blockchain. So that we have our universal truth. But other things that could be using other blockchains to do that, sort of like off chain or like you know kind of sort of transactional. Yeah. Yeah. We can. Uh, I don't know if you guys are for starters. So we can talk about that after. If you yeah. Sure. Things. Sure. Yeah, we'll put that a more minutes and uh, get started. Are you recording right now? Or? Yeah, it's part now. Say hi, Jack. Okay. We will just kick off now then. Alrighty, guys. Welcome again to another event from Crypto Bay. This one is going to be dedicated to EOS because, as much of us know, EOS is doing its mainnet launch tomorrow. And there has been a lot of debate in the 
cryptocurrency community about whether EOS is going to work <coughs> or whether it's going to fail. So when I first met Jack, uh, Jack was working on the Steam blockchain. Steam was developed by the same developer that's developing EOS. And Jack began researching EOS and became a huge advocate for it. But I have a lot of doubts about EOS, its consensus algorithm, and whether it can really work. But me and Jack had a debates here and there over certain points, and I'm a bit more open to it, but I still have some concerns. So how this one's going to work is I'm kind of going to make a case almost against EOS and raise some of these concerns. If you guys have any discussion points or want to say anything, just like raise your hand or shout out, and uh, you're more than free to make some points. And then Jack's going to share his expertise on why he really believes EOS is going to work well. And afterwards, everybody is welcome to free drinks on the second floor and on the terrace. So, the scalability trilemma was proposed by the Ethereum founder, Vitalik Buterin. And basically, for any blockchain system in which every transaction is going to be validated by a node, it's put forward that you can only treat two of the, these three things. Decentralization of block production, as me measured by the number of nodes. Safety, as measured by the cost of a 51% attack. And scalability, as measured by transactions per second. So, obviously Ethereum achieves decentralization and safety very well, but it's very, very shy at scalability. It can only do 15 transactions per second. It's one application, CryptoKitties, almost crashed the network. So, EOS proposes a solution to, to this. What is EOS? It's going to be uh, open source software developed by Block.1, a company registered in the Cayman Islands. The CEO is Brendan Bloomer. The company is for profit. And it's going to be developed by Daniel Larimer, who has also developed BitShares and Steam. The blockchain is not going to be launched by Block.1. The blockchain is going to be developed by Block.1, then it's going to be released as open source and it's up to members of the community to launch the network. If you anybody here bought into EOS over the past year, you're essentially participating in a year-long ICO. So the blockchain do doesn't exist at the moment. People who bought the into EOS, the funds went to block that one for their development of the blockchain. So let's look at where EOS is right now. Currently, it's standing fifth in terms of total market cap of cryptocurrencies. So imagine this, imagine a public company on the stock market said to the public, okay guys, we're gonna do this, this, and this, and we're gonna fundraise for one year. They have no balance sheet, no record of profits, no product, and then they're ranked fifth out of all market cap, all based on saying what they're gonna do. This sounds really crazy, but this is actually the current state of the cryptocurrency market at the moment. So what are you buying into when you buy EOS tokens? Well, it says in the terms and conditions, I know it's hard to see the print here, but the EOS token doesn't have any rights, any uses, any purposes, and it's going to have no features on the EOS platform. And how is the tokens distributed? And what is their use case? So there's going to be 1 billion tokens in total. 100 billion goes directly to block.1, not to be used, just for pretty much profit. 900,000, uh, sorry, 900 billion goes to investors and it's pretty much released over the year long in 2 million intervals. So they're pretty much getting as many people in as possible. And so what, what, like what is the use case of these, these tokens? So the idea is that once the ICO is over, which is actually tomorrow, a snapshot of the tokens is going to be taken and then when someone does launch the blockchain you will be given EOS tokens equivalent to what you own. And these EOS tokens are going to represent bandwidth on the network. So when validators of transactions 
when validators of transactions look at look out to the network, people with more tokens are going to get validated quicker. And on the Genesis block, the different businesses which might have their own native tokens, you will also get these tokens in proportion to what EOS tokens you have. So here's the big question. Do businesses need a blockchain? What are the benefits of a blockchain? We have immutability, we have automability. Sometimes this comes at a trade-off of privacy because if every transaction goes onto the blockchain and the whole public can see it, then the whole public has a view into what you're doing, what you're doing with the business, what the business is doing with you, and sometimes some things need to be private. With a blockchain, another benefit is there's no single point of failure. Another thing is we have censorship resistance. What have some of the successes been using the blockchain? Well, we have cryptocurrencies. The blockchain works extremely well as a uh, the blockchain works extremely well as a form of money because with money, it's actually beneficial when it doesn't change and it is audible and there's a track. Also, ICOs. Really, that's been the killer application. Companies have been able to raise money in a different way. Crypto kitties, not so much. It, as I said, it almost crashed the Ethereum network. And what do businesses in the modern day need to be able to do? They need to be able to upgrade fast, they need to be able to change fast, and they need to be scalable. And so far, blockchains have not been able to deliver on that. They've been slow to change, slow to upgrade, and they haven't been scalable. So EOS uh, proposes a solution to this. They propose a different way to do it to make this possible. With Bitcoin and with Ethereum, the way a transaction is validated is through a proof of work process. So the entire ledger is checked back to the start using the computer's computing power to check that a user has funds to make a transaction valid and that there's a digital signature attached. This is very intensive and takes a long time. With EOS, they propose a different mechanism to reach consensus. So each token holder is going to elect block producers who are in charge of validating transactions. And these block producers elected by the community, their job is to validate these transactions and it's going to be a completely different process. Has it achieved the results that we think it will achieve? On the testnet, EOS has achieved 500 transactions per second, and Daniel Larimer forecasts that on the mainnet launch, it will achieve 1,000 to 6,000 transactions per second. But this process and this proposal comes with a lot of concerns. First of all, with delegated proof of stake, because there's only 21 block producers, security is definitely a big issue. So imagine during this ICO, a lot of the tokens end up in a small number of people's hands, and block producers can essentially bribe the token holders to vote for them, and they can collude to make invalid transactions or make transactions for their own benefit or stop transactions that are against what they believe in. We also have the issue of decentralization. Decentralization can be a very subjective measure. How many block producers is just one metric to measure it. But also a case can be made that 21 block producers will lead to a decentralized system. Because imagine a case with Bitcoin where the Chinese government takes over all the miners in the country and um, it would have a huge impact on the Bitcoin network. We also have concerns about bugs on the EOS network. We have both Nick Zabo and Charlie Lee speaking out in the news that they're concerned that when the EOS network launches, it's going to be launched well and there's not going to be bugs in it. There's also the case that in each EOS transaction, has to be included a hash of constitution, which is wrote by the VP uh, of product of EOS. So as I mentioned, one of the benefits of a blockchain is censorship resistance. But if there is a constitution which needs to be included in every transaction, isn't that taken away from the 
uh, censorship resistance benefit of decentralization and of using the blockchain. And there's also the case of governance. So with Bitcoin and Ethereum, there's off-chain governance, which means through certain uh, social developments and communication between developers and people in the community, people come to a decision on how to operate Bitcoin and what needs to be done next. With EOS, this could be the first big test of whether on-chain governance is going to work. This means that as the chain is being developed, um, token holders are able to vote for different block producers as the chain goes on. And also, a big question is what will the tokens actually represent and how will this be valuable? Because potentially, so EOS is after raising four billion for their ICO. This has been the biggest ICO in the history of ICOs. Um, it's, you don't need EOS to interact with the network. It represents bandwidth, but how do we really value this? Because we don't know how big the network is going to be. We don't even know if businesses are going to bother building on the EOS blockchain. So how, how do we put a figure on whether this is actually worth our money in investing in, or whether we've essentially paid four billion and now it's not going to be worth hardly anything? So from an investor viewpoint, I see a number of different scenarios playing out. EOS could be a huge success. Businesses could jump on the opportunity of using a blockchain, which is scalable, and the token becomes hugely valuable. EOS becomes a huge success, and businesses use it, but the token isn't so valuable, and we hugely overpay for it. Four billion seems like a lot of money to pay for some open source software that has to be launched by the community. Another scenario is a failure due to the model. It's going to be a test of the governance system. It's going to be a test of delegated proof of stake. And if one of these doesn't work, EOS will essentially fail. And another scenario is failure due to adoption. That maybe these systems do work, but businesses just aren't suitable to be built on the blockchain. And blockchain is more for money and ICOs. And uh, Businesses don't build and EOS just becomes another Ethereum. So I'm going to pass on to Jack. If you have any points, want to jump in with any questions, please just like raise your hand or shout out. And uh, Jack's going to give some positive points on EOS. Right. So does anyone have questions for John before I move on? Uh, I mean, what is the reward for the block producers? Uh, OK, so I guess I'll get to that. That's the thing I So hello, everyone. My name is Jack. Um, I've been in the blockchain space since 2013, trying to do various uh, small projects here and there. Uh, back in 2013, Bitcoin was still a very small project, but it did open an office right in the smack in the middle of Wall Street. So I said, okay, here's this thing called Bitcoin. It's a kind of office in the middle of Wall Street. I'll go in. Uh, I sat down for one of the presentations. It was kind of funny because you had Bitcoin speakers talking to bankers, CEOs, and audience about how they have destroyed their business and how banks won't exist in five years. So here we are, five years later, banks still exist. Obviously, uh, use credit cards. Um, I haven't bought anything with Bitcoin just yet. Uh, hopefully, that will change in the future. But it has been very interesting to see the industry um, five years ago versus the industry now. Um, so yeah. So just before we get too deep into it, I just want to see um, what my audience is like. So. Who here has a technical background? Please raise your hand. Okay, who doesn't have a technical background? Okay, okay, so you have a nice split, half and half. Very cool. Um, who here knows about blockchain? Okay, 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 okay. Who has who has cryptocurrency? Bitcoin, Ethereum. Okay, good, good, good. Who has used a cryptocurrency application like CryptoKitties? Or a decentralized exchange like DEX. Two people. Three people. Okay, so that kind of tells you what the state of the industry is right now. Almost everyone knows about blockchain and Bitcoin and Ethereum, one of these blockchain platforms, but not many people have actually interacted with it. You might have held some cryptocurrency for investment um, purposes or speculative purposes, but the, the truth of the matter is, 
you're not really using cryptocurrency. So the GDOS project is trying to change that. It's trying to get everyone to start using projects that are built on the blockchain without them having to have a very technical background. So before we go too deep, uh, I just want to address some of the concerns that um, John raised. Uh, those are very good points. <coughs> so the ethos of the Bitcoin project is decentralization. Decentralization, decentralization, decentralization. You, as a Bitcoin user, should have your own phone node. You should have the entire history of the Bitcoin blockchain, but you don't. Uh, this is because it's very difficult to keep the entire history of the blockchain. Uh, it's not very difficult to set up a Bitcoin node but it is very difficult for the average person. Um, so when Bitcoin says decentralization, what does that really mean? It means it's fault tolerant. That means there's no Bitcoin entity, there's no Bitcoin bank, you can't just go and blow up Bitcoin. Uh, and you, if you want to take down Bitcoin, you have to destroy every single Bitcoin node that's in existence. They we have about somewhere like 10,000 nodes, the number could be higher, um, it's just as so 10,000 nodes, uh, all connected, you have to find every, each and every single one of them to destroy, and destroy each and every single one of them in order to count. <coughs> but even though there's so many nodes, it does not mean all those nodes are the same. We have what's called Bitcoin miners, and these are the nodes that actually get to write the history. You might have the entire history of the Bitcoin blockchain on your full node, but there's only a handful of people, uh, and they mostly all live in China. Um, and they mostly live within a certain area of China where the electricity is very cheap. So even though we get to keep the full history of Bitcoin blockchain, we do not get to write the history. So, <clears throat> so who should we get to write the history? Who should we trust to pass on transactions and validate our transactions? That's one of the philosophical differences that Bitcoin and the EOS has. Bitcoin says whoever is secure does most work on the network. Well, Bitcoin's definition of work is um, secure network through what's called a hashing algorithm. Um, the more difficulty to hash, the mining difficulty is, the more difficult it is to undo it. Uh, EOS is a different approach. Uh, we say, okay, we select members of our community who we trust do voting to become those who write in history books. So that's a different approach. Bitcoin, proof of work, meritocratic, uh, hashing power. Uh, EOS, structured trust. Uh, who do we choose? Who do we trust to write the history? So, legal responsibilities. So, it is true that in the EOS um, white paper, they say they do nothing, absolutely nothing for your tokens. Uh, this is twofold. One is because, unfortunately, in the company assets, um, the state of the ICO or cryptocurrency industry now is that the governments are looking, especially the US government, are looking at every single ICO and trying to nail them down. So if anywhere <coughs> in your white paper that you promise to say, you make any promise about the value of token increasing, you're secure. And if you're security, you have to deal with the United States government. No exceptions. So, yes. All the, that's only in the case that anyone entered the US market. That's also true, but it's also true in China. China has uh, clamped down on ICOs, so those are the two biggest markets we're missing out. Um, so a lot of companies, what they do is they write out specifically that they're not going to do anything for tokens. If you invest in speculative purposes, you might lose your money. And that's true. Even if you invest in Bitcoin today, we don't know, what, <clears throat> we don't know for sure what the future of Bitcoin is. It looks very bright because the market cap it's about $125 billion right now, but we don't know. They could crash them all and we could all lose our money. There's no guarantee. So this is just the nature of the industry as a whole. So $4 billion, $4 billion, that's a lot of money. Uh, in comparison, when Ethereum did its ICO back in 2014, they only raised $80 million. So $80 million is 222 times smaller than $4 billion. Uh, it was not about Vitalik. Uh, at the time, people didn't trust them. The talent is a writer for Bitcoin Magazine. He never wrote any blockchain software before that. His partner was what uh, Charles Hopkins, um, who worked on this year's with the founder of EOS, um, is what gave <coughs> abilities to the Ethereum project. And but even still, there was a lot of gripes against it. 
back in the day, the whole cryptocurrency ecosystem was only about $11 billion. So it was a lot smaller now. Uh, so $4 billion is a lot, but at the backdrop of a $333 billion industry. So it's a small fraction of the entire industry. Just like how the air was a small fraction of the industry. Right? What's the ether amount of currency? Sorry? Because all the us ICOs are raising ethers. Uh huh. What's the amount of ether? Oh, I don't know the specific numbers. It's a $4 billion equivalent in today's ether price. So, John, do you know? Sorry, what's the question? How much they raise in Ethereum? Yeah, so Ethereum's price today increased four billion raised by EOS. No, no, but what's the unit in Ether to EOS raise? Uh, oh, I have no idea. I think somewhere like two hundred thousand, maybe more. So EOS like five hundred seventy dollars at the moment. So if you yeah, by four billion by five hundred seventy, it's whatever that figure is. It's, it's a lot. It's uh, I think it's like eight percent of Ethereum's market cap or something like that, John. So it's a, yeah, good, chunk, so it's, it's it's a good chunk of the theory. Yeah. And then the last thing is co security. So EOS is actually not a brand new project that now starting from scratch. Um, Dan Lambert developed two other projects on similar code base called BitShare and Steam. Uh, these code has been running for the last five years. And most of the security flaws, critical flaws in here today, are the same flaws that are discovered at this, uh, in those systems back in the day. They have been patched. BitShare and Steam are still running fine. Nothing's been hacked, no critical failures just yet. So that's the issues and concerns uh, out of the way. If you have more on those areas, I'm happy to answer now quickly or after the presentation. I can wait. Okay, cool. So understand what Bitcoin was aimed to do. Bitcoin was envisioned a way to take power away from the man and give it back to the people. We are gonna be our banks. We all got to run our Bitcoin nodes and we know exactly how much we have in the bank account and the banks cannot touch our money. They cannot use it just for speculation. They cannot use it to do risky investments. It's our money. We have the private key. They cannot touch it. That's, that, was the, that was the point. Um, and what was it, what did Ethereum aim to do? Ethereum took the same concept. It's like, okay, uh, if we can all keep the record the same thing, and we could all apply the same rules to it, that means we could have computation on the database. If you all apply the same rules to the same set of database, we should all arrive at the same outcome. Just like that's how exactly how Bitcoin keeps track of how much each person owns. If I send you money, that transaction is played on all your nodes, and that calculation is performed on all those nodes, and we all have the same output. EDM just takes it and make it more general purpose. So you run like applications. Uh, Today, most of those EDM applications are still just uh, sending stuff, receiving stuff. So that's where we are right now. So exclaimers, exclaimers, exclaimers. This project is ex experimental, as it is the nature of cryptocurrency projects. A very expensive one, but an experiment nonetheless. Uh, the following slides I got from the CPO of um, Amber, CEO of Block One, and Ian Greg Corner at Block One. So, uh, how again? So, for those of you who are familiar in the blockchain space, is there any names on the board that you recognize? Yeah. yeah? Which ones? All. All of them. Okay, that's good. So, Blockchain Capital is a big venture capital firm. They invest their early investors in a lot of blockchain projects. Guys in Digital is a new player. Uh, they were a merchant merchant bank payment system. They have recently partnered with um, Block Up One to. Uh, create a $400 million uh, VC fund for projects to be developed on the EOS platform. Phone Boucher Capital um, it is a very, very early player in the blockchain industry. It is the same uh, venture capital fund that invested in this year's and a year. And funnily enough, this uh, venture capital firm has on its board Vitalik Buttery, the creator of Ethereum. So, uh, there might be some complex interest there, but I think when there's a good chance to make profit and we can put the differences aside. Uh, Bitfinex is a large exchange um, in the cryptocurrency space. They've kind of launched their own version of decentralized exchange on the EOS blockchain. Bank a very prominent project on the Ethereum platform, and they also plan to migrate to EOS. The last one, I don't know, because they don't have any sign. I don't know what the language that is. 
in there. Okay, so what is EOS aiming to do? EOS is trying to build businesses. They're trying to build businesses on the blockchain. So to put an analogy, right, we have everyone to know Apple products, we use Apple application. So the applications in the, this case is our businesses. When you use iTunes, you're paying iTunes for music. That's the iTunes business. But the iTunes application is built on top of the Mac OS, Apple's operating system. And the operating system is built off of a computer, the actual computer, the Apple computer itself. There's hardware, um, you know, RAM, hard disk, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So right now, we're very good here. We have Bitcoin and we have Ethereum. We're not very good here. And because we're not very good here, we don't have very good applications. Um, so Ethereum is a great computer. Uh, Bitcoin is a great, Bitcoin network is a great computer, but it's not a great operating system. There's just no kind of the structure that will allow for you to create a user application uh, that average, average people can interact with easily. Why is this? Why, why is it so hard to build application on top of um, blockchain platforms nowadays? Well, let's think about what these applications need. Well, they gotta have to be on the web, most people can interact with applications on the web these days. Um, when you go to your favorite website, Facebook, whatever, that's an application on the web. Very easy to interact with. You don't have to download any kind of uh, specific hardware or software to do that. Uh, it's got to be able to handle millions of users. Um, right now, the most popular application on Ethereum blockchain, or the most popular ever in the history of Ethereum blockchain, was CryptoKitties. And it's, at its height, it had only 12 thousand users before the network completely crashed. Unusable. Uh, to send anything, to do any action on the ADM network, when crypto videos are tight, you will have to pay an insane amount of transaction fee. It's gotta be free. Every ADM application, every action you do, a trade, exchange, a submission, even just sending a message, you have to pay for it. Uh, so we are used to we're we're used to using our applications free. Imagine you have to pay for a click on Facebook, or imagine you have to pay for a like on Instagram. That just turns a lot of people off right away. Right? Why would why should they use a subsidize for business operation costs? That should be on the application developer. Infrastructure should be their business. We ask as you ask the users should just use the application. And if it's a application that we have to pay for, we pay upfront once and that's it. We shouldn't have to be charged every single time we want to interact with the application. It has to be responsive. Block times on Bitcoin are 10 minutes apart, so if you get, click like, uh, you have a Facebook like application on Bitcoin, you click like, you have to wait 10 minutes, and then that like will actually be confirmed. Uh, Ethereum is a little bit better, it's 15 seconds uh, per block, so it's a little bit faster, but you know, still click. Okay, you liked. So it's, it's too slow, it's too slow. We need faster things. We need like, we touch, it's gotta move. We touch, it's gotta move. Uh, account names, who has here dealt with Bitcoin addresses or Ethereum addresses? Okay, <laughs> do you remember your Bitcoin or Ethereum addresses? Absolutely not. No, nobody does. Uh, Ethereum is a little bit better on this case. They have a Ethereum name address, so you got to register your name. So that makes things a little bit easier. Uh, again, you don't, shouldn't have to pay for anything. And if you lose your account, let's say someone steals your private key on Bitcoin or Ethereum, what happens? What happens when you lose your Bitcoin private key? Oh, it's gone. Your money's gone. You're never getting it back, ever. So, but there's, there's got to be a way for you to recover your account. For the everyday user, okay, if you lose your key, if you forget it completely, okay, then the system is designed so you won't be able to access it again. But if your key gets compromised, there should be a way for you to recover your password and recover your account. Because we try to do application, not just funds, but also data, also our information. Uh, if we have, we're doing identity application, we don't want uh, anyone, we don't want people running around using our identity on different platforms. Uh, we don't want people to commit identity fraud. And bugs. Who here have heard of the DAO hack? Or the DAO, the DAO? DAO. So the EMDAO was an application on the EDM network, one of the first ones, one of the biggest ones. And there was a software bug in it. And, okay, this was bug, bug happened in software all the time. 
But the thing about Ethereum applications, once you deploy your application, there's no way to change it. So what happened when the bug in the Ethereum DAO was discovered? They, the, the people who invest in the Ethereum DAO, which is a centralized investment firm, literally had to sit there and watch as the money was slowly being drained. And there's absolutely nothing you can do. But what if you can? What if software's not Software is never going to be perfect. Another another case in the DM network, Parity Wallet, a very um, very prominent wallet that's designed and released by the CTO of Ethereum, the guy who wrote the program language for the Ethereum network, had a software bug, and the user accidentally, not even maliciously, disabled the wallet, locking out about four hundred million dollars worth of funds. That money is gone. You're never going to see it again. So in any scenario, losing that kind of money would mean the end of your business, right? But because we're in the cryptocurrency space, logic still not apply. Money is not a big deal. Um, but there should be a way to update the program and get anyone's money back. That's only fair. That's only the right, that's the right thing to do. So just for some more context, um, here is a chart of all the blockchains and how much things are happening on them at any second. So on the top is Steam, it's one of these Stan Lambert is the CEO of EOS previous projects. It tops a chart of about a million seven hundred thousand transactions per day. Uh, yes, so this is a seven day average. And you can see it's operating at less than 0.1% of its um, total capacity. That means this number could be easily scaled to 100 million or a billion transactions per second. And in comparison, EDM does about 500 transactions per day and is halfway here. So EDM could do up to a million per day, but that's about it. The blockchain will be completely full, you cannot do anything anymore. And you have this year was another project by Dan Lermer. Um, it's also up there. This number low simple because not many people use it. And you see again, it's doing very, very much below its capacity. And here we have Bitcoin. It's doing about just under 200 million transactions, transactions today, and it's almost halfway full. So. Um, if you send any Bitcoin transactions before, you notice how expensive the transaction fee is. You know how long you have to wait. So we want to do faster, cheaper, and we want, we want to be able to do more of it. So how do we do that? We do that by parallel processing. So this is already something that is, um, is sort of in place in Bitcoin with SegWit, where you have the signature validation and transaction validation happening at the same time. We just take this one step further. Um, the only way to scale blockchain, right, is to have parallel blockchains running all the time. So with EOS, we could run millions of blockchains in parallel by the same people, and you can all communicate with one another. This is how we scale. So horizontal scaling, asynchronous communication. That means if I send you a transaction, you don't have, we don't both have to be on the network at the same time for that to happen. I send you a transaction, once it comes online, that transaction actually gets processed. And all the chains could talk to each other, that way we could, could create applications across different blockchains and have those processes run in parallel. Um, it's the first EOS, uh, EOS is the first blockchain operating system, but that just means it gives you the structure to build your application instead of having to build from the ground up. I have the base, the, the base level, you have, some, you have accounts, you have Actions you have handlers. If you go, if you guys dealt with um, web applications in any way, so these are very familiar concepts in um, web programming that you can apply to blockchain programming today. And yeah, it just makes it a lot easier to build applications. Um, you don't have to be a Solidity developer. You don't have to be a Bitcoin developer. Uh, if you know any kind of general purpose program language. Is either supported now or be supported in the future. So you don't have to pay $250,000 for Bitcoin or a Darren developer if you want to build an application. 
Okay, so features. It's scalable, you can do a lot of things, uh, a lot of applications run at the same time. If I'm running my application on Ethereum, I don't want the success of CryptoKitty to be the death of my application. If CryptoKitty is doing well, good for them. But that shouldn't make my users pay more for running my application. What EOS does is to give you some baseline performance that's always going to be there. You could all, your user could always do a certain amount of, conduct a certain amount of activity here. That baseline is guaranteed. So as a business, you have that reliability, which is what business need. You need business need to be reliable, right? If you charge five dollars for a meal one day and you charge ten dollars for a meal the next day, your customers not gonna come back. They don't know what to expect. You want those repeat customers, right? As a business, uh, it's governed. If something goes wrong on the blockchain, uh, if someone steals your money and you have evidence to prove it, there is a process you could go through. If someone uh, let's say launch a pyramid scheme and try to sell it to you as an investment uh, advice, there there could be action action could be to be taken could be taken to help you recover those funds. It's not the wild west. It's not Bitcoin. It's not Ethereum. People just can't take your private keys and run. People just can't hack you and expect to get away. We have law on the blockchain, and this law is reinforced by the community. And it's flexible. If your application is broken, you can always update it. So in case of the DAO, we can, what we can do is when the exploit was um, discovered, we can freeze it, and there's no way to fix the problem except updating the code. You go to our community leaders, the people you put elected into place, say, hey, this code's broken, we need to update it. And then they'll update it for you. So you won't, your customers won't lose all the fun and you won't lose all your credibility. And yeah, and it's just like developing any web applications. Sorry. Yes. The, the love part. How do you make it? I have uh, people who vote uh, that some funds should be retreated back to give it back to someone that. Uh, was no. Or no problem. No, there's an arbitration process. You must provide evidence of, let's say. Um, can you give me a specific example? Maybe I can uh, explain that. Uh, enterprise that, uh, that someone knows that is uh, fraudulent because okay. you see evidence in the Okay, okay. So let's say, so in what what happens in EOS is when you launch your application, when you launch a business, you have what's called a Ricardia contract. That's a human readable contract. It describes what your software is intended to do, what your business model is, and basically everything your customer needs before he enters into agreement with you. And then you have an application that's deployed on the EOS blockchain. If you as a business violates what you say your application is going to do, then you'll be held accountable. right? And that goes to the arbitration process. Um, the arbitrator is selected by the community to weigh the evidence. And if they do find that you're in the wrong, you can either freeze your account or, um, I think I might have skipped this, sorry. But to run, to run your business, you have to stake your tokens in the blockchain. So what they could do is confiscate the tokens you have staked and give it back to the user who you have wrong. Okay, do you have a uh, I forgot. Okay, well, I'll give you some time to think about it. And has the enterprise used already those funds? Sorry? You can recover partially the funds. Yes, you could recover partially. Um, exactly. Yes. Uh, so, so these elected block producers, what sort of vetting process do they go through? Are they announced uh, on the EOS uh, site? So again, EOS takes a very philosophical, different philosophical approach to blockchain governance than Bitcoin and Ethereum. In Bitcoin and Ethereum, the focus is still on anonymity. You want to be able to hide who you are, you want to be able to keep your privacy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Whereas EOS takes the public ledger's network and the identity in public. So you, um, as of now, all the block producers that are running have their identity on the public. They disclose their <coughs> financial information. You know exactly where their nodes are. Um, in the future, I see that the community probably uh, <coughs> vote to have some independent third party edit 
of all the bar producers' notes, or maybe independent edit of all the financial situations, to make sure they're fully independent and it's only for the benefit, working in the benefit of the EOS blockchain. Like auditing. Like auditing. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, yes. How do you guarantee that that is a truly decentralized thing and not become the kind of Kafka? Because with just 21, right, and with the banks willing to get into the things mm -hmm. and the other big players. So there's two way to answer this question. Uh, one is um, yes, the block producers could collude. But yes, the token owners can also vote them out. So it's up to the people to decide, as up to the token holders to decide. Another way to look at this is you are the investors in the business. If someone managed to buy a big share of the business and essentially trying to do what's a hostile takeover, there's not much you could do, but I mean, like, likely it would drive up the share because the buy up all the shares. Executing a 51% attack is much more extensive in the proof of stake system. And even after they bought up all the shares, what you can do is sell your shares and move on to a different company. So if someone comes and buys 51% of your business, it's just, you know, now he owns your business. It's up to you whether or not you want to sell them that much. It's up to the community whether or not you want to sell this actor, potentially malicious actor, that was stake. And there is another, um, for this specific EOS blockchain that we're talking about, because there will likely be multiple end of implementations uh, by different parties. In this specific one, there is written in the constitution that no one party shall hold more than 10% of the network tokens. So that makes something like a 51% attack very difficult. Um, Obviously, there is a chance of someone just using multiple identities to hold multiple tokens. That is the case, but um, it's the best we could do to uh, diminish the chance of that happening. Uh, chance of that happening. So, since we talk, since we talk about block producers and the constitution, one of the most unique features about EOS again is the on-chain governance, and it's this idea of the constitution. So why do we need a constitution? In Bitcoin and Ethereum, and in Ethereum specifically, and even more specifically, in Ethereum Classic, there's an ethos called law is, uh, code is law. <coughs> Whatever is written in the program, that's the law of the blockchain. A pro if a program behaves a certain way, that's, that's because it's coded to do. That's why the Ethereum, that's why Ethereum Classic did not fork, uh, the DAO hack, is still, is that history is still there in the EM Classic. Whereas EOS takes a different philosophy where not every scenario could be anticipated by software code and not every scenario could be dealt with by uh, program code. So the, the idea of the constitution is to enforce laws where code cannot do the community. So one example of these uh, laws that the code cannot enforce its rights, its uh, property rights specifically. I'll just read this quickly. The member grants the right of contract and of private property to each other, thereby no property shall change hands except with the consent of the owner by a valid arbitrator's order or committee referendum. This constitution creates no positive rights for or between any members. So this is a very convoluted way of saying, if someone goes and steals your money, steals your private key, and you have the evidence to prove it in a court, in a blockchain court, we will reverse that transaction. We will make you right. Your property is still your property. Just because I put my wallet out on the table, and I turn around and someone took it, that does not mean that money belongs to him. That money still belongs to me because I have my property right. So that's one of the laws, one of the things I cannot enforce with code. In Bitcoin Ethereum, if you lose your private key, that's it. Your property is gone. Um, a little bit more example, open source, all the contracts, um, all the things published on the network are open source by default. This is kind of already kind of given uh, because you know you can see the code online, you could like um, you could copy it, you know, if it's a piece of art, you can copy it. But this is just to protect community members uh, that and 
enforce ethos open source that if you put something out there, we as a community are all allowed to use it. So it's open source by default. And same thing with publishing, intellectual property rights. Um, uh, you will have to make sure you don't publish your intellectual property on the EOS blockchain because if you do, it's considered open. It's considered under Creative Commons and it's open to everyone's use. And I think there's good and bad in this, but the way I think about it is uh, during the early days of the internet, one of my favorite things on the internet was remixes. People were just putting out music video and remixing music video. And then it was kind of like a very open uh, platform. You could just take material and you could just add on to it. You don't have to worry about copyright uh, suits. You don't have to write about worry about like lawyers sending you letters, taking out requests, and any kind, any kind of stuff. You're just free to do whatever it is that you want to with the material that you have that you found online. So I think that is um, a positive change. Yes, sir. Regarding copyright, yes. how do you go with the, the laws in different countries? Because copyright right. is in the US right. is very different from the Exactly. And this is one of the benefits of um, having the chance to elect block producers. So it might be the case that we just cease operation in that certain jurisdiction, right? We just select a, a, diff, a block producer in a different location with laws that are compatible with our constitution, so we can continue operating. It would not shut down our business because uh, our business is on the blockchain and the blockchain could be located anywhere in the world. It can even be a satellite going up in space as the Bitcoin node is. Um, yeah. And so having the ability to choose where we place our block producers give us a more flexibility also in the legal uh, jurisdictions we want to operate. Okay? And yes. in, case of, in case of conflict, uh, in case of litigation, mm -hmm. uh, who votes that process? The constitution is the, the entire community? There are certain levels of uh, um, peers that are elected to, to vote them. In, in terms of publishing new constitution? No, in or terms of deciding, for instance, if there was a stolen account or if there was a... There would be an arbitrator. And the arbitrator would be appointed by the block producers. One arbitrator? No, not one. There'd be many. Uh, there's been many different, different forms for different kinds of arbitration. And the the arbitrary number could vary from one or three or five, as long as the odd number you break the tie, etc. Per case. Sorry? And per case. It's per case. Per case. Per case, per case. Per case yes. Wouldn't this end up being very, very slow? Well, we're about to find out. Um, I think I think there will be disputes where the community just think, don't think it's worth the effort. Let's say you lost ten dollars, someone stole your private key, took away your account, you lost ten bucks, you file a complaint. Probably not worth the effort, but let's say you lost a hundred million dollars. Okay, then we might have to do something. So there's kind of the details got to be sorted out at which threshold would warrant a arbitration and a case resolution. Is that implementation already in place? Sorry. Is that implementation already in place, or it's in the roadmap? Uh, arbitration. Yes. Uh, arbitration is ready in place, so this is a form for you to go. Again, the details are not very clear yet. We haven't had any case yet, so it's kind of exciting to see which what the first case will be um, and see how the community can it. So this it will be like an evolving thing. So what happens when you find a bug? I heard like this week mm -hmm. you found an issue with the EOS. Uh, you can get a little Right, right. Um, well, the funny thing is, Vitalik knows Dan Lambert from way back. Like, they're, before the they double budget, they were actually quite connected. And Charles Hopkins is the person they both have worked with. So, again, that blockchain community is pretty small, pretty much no one. Um, as for the bugs, um, is it the fork when 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 anybody wants to, to commit some new code? Mm -hmm. Will there be a EOS uh, hard fork when you 
it wouldn't it wouldn't be a hard fork in a traditional sense. Um, if you hard fork today, what you're left with is two different chains, right? In an EOS hard fork, there will still only be one chain at the end. So, um, yeah, you would have to get the and constitution could be changed. Uh, its constitution is how you make any amendments in case there's something that we left out in the constitution or something we want to modify. It would require two thirds, two thirds of the EPs, the block producers, to modify the constitution, and they have to be and they have to maintain their approval of the constitution, and the community have to maintain their approval of the block producers to change constitutions for 90 days. So it's um, there is a threshold so that things don't have to change all the time. In the case of emergency bugs, critical bugs, there is a direct bypass where you could skip. Um, it's kind of like uh, martial law <coughs> in terms of you know like dramatic events um, that will give the BPs power to just change, make change, upgrade code unilaterally. But it still have to be a consensus of all the block producers. It can't just be one guy. Upgrading the code. It had to be everybody. When you compare this with the Cardano project, for example, where they have, with the Cardano project, okay. where they have kind of a voting system right. where it is to prove partially the something when you get all the transition I have to be very honest, I don't know too much about Padana to make it educated. Because every person goes to the top of the world, I see that. Because it has a lot of data theory behind it. Otherwise, yeah. So they won't have the incentive to participate in that type of project. Fair enough. Fair enough. No, I understand perfectly. Uh, this is a personal opinion, not related to yours. I think game theory is overhyped. Um, not everything could be captured by economics. And I think trying to shove game theory into realms where it don't belong is just creates a very complicated mess that no one can understand. And that's my position on that. You get disagree with me. What are the alternatives? Sorry? What are the alternatives? Have a user. You have to be backed by some game theory, otherwise the sentence won't be there. Imagine that the, when there is no more, for example, there is no more to, to mine. Okay. Well, there are different incentives for the mining. It's so, not the perfect world. Right, right, right. You have to do simulations and see what it takes. So, you have to support it with some game theory, otherwise. Fair enough. But there are a history, a long history of the, a long, the, the open source movement. It's a long history of people just voluntarily contributing their time. There was no economic incentive. What they get, did get was reputation and recognition from the industry. So these are the things that are not economic, but are still motives for people to act. And this is part, uh, in part, what is um, driving the block producers. Um, one of the people who actually came out to say, hey, we want to become a block producer, but that was rejected by the community was Bitmain. So Bitmain <coughs> for the largest um, Bitcoin ASIC producers, they produce most of the mining chips in the blockchain industry, but they have a very um, bad reputation in the industry. So even though they have the technical capabilities of maintaining and operating a block producing node, the community to say, hey, you gotta have a shady pass, probably not a good fit for us. We'll pass, we'll pick someone else. So, Decisions made in the EOS not just purely for economics. The actors in EOS are not purely rational economic actors, as is assumption made by Bitcoin and Ethereum. There are other factors that we take into consideration when trying to make this network work. So. Any other questions? Um, um, yes. yes, you and you. Uh, you mentioned. Uh, Economic theory, mm -hmm. but now the way you reason, it sounds like you are also interested in psychology, in decision making. Is there a psychologist in the EOS team? Uh, so is there a psychologist in the EOS yeah. team? Because not to my knowledge. <laughs> um, 
I think, yeah, there's some psychological uh, aspects to it. I think it's, like, why do people vote for public office, right? Public office, it, excluding the very corrupt politician that makes a lot of money from this position, a lot of people, honest people, want to get into politics because they want to do something good, they want to get recognition. So I guess that's the psychological reward for those people, like they want to be public, they want to be recognized. I mean, um, take Reddit as an example. Reddit's not, not for profit, but right. the moderators on that platform, they do it for the karma. They exactly. do it exactly. as, as building blocks of this, the, the society. Yeah, exactly. So there are a lot of things under that economic <laughs> incentives. Actually, I would even argue one of the projects I was very uh, a big fan of was Steam. But they apply the economics model everywhere, where everything is economic, like it's a rational economic calculation, and that's made the platform very not not focused on content and more focused on the money, and that's made it a very unpleasant system to use. So there, are, there, are, there are good reasons to exclude economics from certain things. Well, at least not just solely based on decision on economics. Yes, I understand that. Oh, sorry. The mainnet is supposed to be alive tomorrow. Uh, they are trying to launch the mainnet. Uh, we see how that goes. There are a lot of um, difficulties and complications. We're going to have to coordinate, make sure they suffer DDoS attacks, make sure they're connected right now. So there's a lot of things happening. Uh, and they've been practicing or quite, it's, they almost make this sound like a rocket launch. It's like, you know, stage one, stage two, stage three, Delta's like stage 15, so they've been practicing. By um, what I read, it requires 15% of the players in the state. Yes. And there's 180 projects for their hours. 180 projects? 180 projects to vote on currently. Oh, uh, block producers. Yes. Okay. Okay, all block producers. Right. right. Um, and the voting process is very good. Yeah, well, so it doesn't exist usually if it's through CLI, which most people are less reasonably technical. This is also something I I think I I understand that block one wants to be as independent from the mainnet launch as possible, but I do think that maybe if it would have provided a rolling tool that wouldn't have been too bad. But there are rolling tools floating around and it does take 50% of token holders to vote on a chain for that to become a valid chain. So right now, you, you have 10 different chains launch, but if no one's voting and the threshold never reaches 15%, none of the chains are legitimate. Only when 15% of all token holders vote on one chain, achieve that 50% threshold, it becomes live and anyone can uh, start participating. Do you think that's a big problem? We'll find out tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Um, personally, I think it might take a little bit longer. It might take a day or two. But I don't think it would be too difficult. Um, the chat's been very active. Um, it's mostly flooding with people who are like, oh, how do I register my EOS tokens? I'm not ready for this. I'm not ready for the mainnet launch. So people know where to look for information. That, that's, a good, that's a good start. So if they do the same thing as they do with finding web version of the tokens, then I think we should be able to reach 50%. Because we have those channels coming to each one. Is there any other producers that you run projects that would be particularly interested? Uh, particularly interesting as well. Like ones that excite you that you think are going to... Yes, so the New York and Canada guys are very good. The Canada, uh, the EOS New York and EOS Canada are yeah. two very good top notch block producers. Very responsive, uh, very active in the community. Uh, EOS Canada is actually developing a lot of tools for launching the blockchain. They're not one actually coordinating the launch, they're the one um, that's providing information. Another very interesting one is BitFinex. Oh, sorry. So BitFinex is actually another block producer as well. This, these guys. Um, they're a block producer, they're based in Israel. They say they have military grade security. Uh, they have the whole setup laid out, uh, laid out. It looks very legit to me. Uh, so I think they also would get my yeah. it, it, It's true, they have military grade shit up in there to visit them. Yeah, so yeah. it's Israel, so. Okay, any other questions?
Uh, this is just in, in relation to the roadmap. So where, where I, I know that mainnet is, is releasing tomorrow, but, mm -hmm. but what, what sort of road, roadmap is EOS estimating? Like, there, there's been some you know, uh, criticism that their ICO has raised this much without them having an actual product. Mm -hmm. Do we know when they're estimating the whole platform to be ready, or when they're just releasing some software and some lines of code? Or? So the, their product, lock that one's product, is software. So technically speaking, the job is done. But what they are doing is they are committing a lot of the capital and race into funding hackathons and funding application developments. So if you take it in that perspective, the, their product is the ecosystem. So when would that be done? Probably never, you know. But, but not the platform? Because earlier you said that you know they have the base layer for the platform that you can build upon. Yeah. So that, that would be the software, right? Yeah. Okay. Oh, you mean the actual network itself? Yeah, the network itself would just be launched by Google. So after the, again, they want to be made as independent as possible. Mm -hmm. And then after the domain is um, stabilized, they can start pouring VC money into projects. <coughs> Kind of like what you know, Ethereum is doing with the Ethereum Foundation, investing in hackathons, projects, trying to get developers to build on top of it. So, yes. How many people are working on this project? The core team, I think, has 20, 23 people. Um, they are a very diverse group, and there are a lot of big blockchain veterans also involved. Um, Dan Larimer being one. Uh, banker people are helping out with one of the base, base level protocols. You know, Bitfenix is helping out with the exchange things. It's an ecosystem, right? You have your core team who's blocked out one developing software, and then you have everyone else that's surrounded with development. So, yeah. I can't say for sure how many people. So, uh, you said you can upgrade uh, or integrate the uh, Yes. Right, yeah, so it would be similar to you using a software, let's say from Microsoft or from another virtual company. Um, the difference is that applications operating on your smart blockchain already have the token state. So if they misbehave or if, the comp, if their advertised product is not as, it doesn't do what is, is intended, you could go to arbitration, sue them, and block producers confiscate their stake tokens to compensate. So they have the rights to that kind of data key, they have the token key that you're looking to present the blockchain. Well, they, all the, they would, they would um, include a transaction that reverse or changes the account. Because again, well, it takes a majority, two thirds of the block producers to maintain um, the transaction to pass it into the history. Any other questions? Yes. How much money have they spent on marketing? Uh, probably loads. Yeah. On I mean, marketing. you don't get into top ten without a product. Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. But I don't know. I actually. Don't know. But one good thing is that because Dan Lambert built Steam, um, and Steam has active content you know, creators there, so a lot of the marketing is actually like done for free on Steam. It's not only done for free if you know how Steam works, and on boats and you get money out of it. So that could be considered their marketing, and like maybe there's a, you, know, you could calculate how many people got money by writing EOS posts, but that's not directly their funding. You know, the content creators. So I don't know. I don't know what their marketing budget is. Yes. Uh, I'm back to my initial question. What is the reward and are the incentives for the block producers? Ah, so the block producers are paid through inflation. So kind of like how block uh, Bitcoin when you mine a block, you reward it with uh, right now it's 12.5 bitcoins when you mine a block. It's kind of the same thing in uh, EOS, but that block the reward would not decrease. It will always be somewhere between 0 and 5% of the inflation. And how much they get paid also depends on the voter. So let's say me and John are both running for block producers. I would say, okay, 
I need 3% of the inflation. And John's comes like, hey, I can provide the same service, I'll pay 1%. Uh, it's only take 1% of the inflation. So if our service are equal, the token holders most likely choose John. And it's kind of like this, the competition for... Actually, you know, speaking of the game theory, yeah. it seems like the equilibrium in that context is the lowest fee for a block producer yeah, yeah. and getting the highest compute power. That's bang for your book. Yeah, yeah. That's decided by the voters. And also based on like if I'm pretty shady, John has a good reputation, they might, you know, be happy to pay the premium for a more expensive block producer. So uh, after the launch, anyone can apply for being a block producer? Yes, anyone can run to be a block producer. Um, and if you're running any kind of exchange service, um, you're probably going to have to keep a full node anyways. So that's why a lot of exchanges are running to be block producers, because the cost for them to be like, is there's no additional cost. They already run a full node. All they have to do is like, hey, vote for me. Uh, I'll become a block producer. But again, not everyone wants only exchanges. Um, we actually have discussed about limiting how many exchanges we allow to become block producers. So there's been a few exchanges that have not been selected because we don't want only the interests of block uh, exchanges be represented in the blockchain. Yes. So, so you're mentioning that, that um, it seems obvious that exchanges can be run on this. What other sorts? What other types of businesses could, could be run on this? What, like, what other uh, types of, of businesses could be run on EOS? Uh, oh, like what applications could be built? Yeah. Okay. Any web application? What, what, what do you think would be like the ideal kind of, kind of application? <laughs> That's the interesting part. That's what I'm trying to figure out too. So I think um, I think I think anything that requires a lot of users, and I think the, I think we got to slowly move. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about how these giant companies just profiting from our data, right? There's going to be more and more push to rewarding the user in a certain way, especially as a user-generated platform, user-generated content platform. I think a lot of those would come. Um, uh, it would make perfect sense. Especially, imagine you have to pay like 10,000 people a day. How, how are you going to pay 10,000 people a day? How do you make sure that transaction is secure? You use a blockchain, right? Um, all this stuff. Probably oh, esteem is too much. Yes, I mean steam like user generated kind of content. I'll just say like Uber, maybe something like Uber, where a lot of people interacting, exchanging with each other, purchasing rides and that kind of stuff. Decentralized marketplaces. Um, yeah. Um, guys, I would recommend that we take the discussion down to the second floor, where uh, everybody's welcome for drinks and is open space on the terrace. Uh, for anybody who did purchase EOS tokens, make sure to register them because theoretically, if you don't register them, they'll actually be lost forever unless you have them on like Binance. So either register them or transfer them to an exchange which uh, is supporting us. What is the date? Hmm? What is the date? Oh, to do it today. Yeah, today is the last day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, don't be, don't be, don't be afraid. Um, be very afraid. Be, be, be kind of afraid. But uh, I think most of the big exchanges are supporting the main net swap. So, 61% of tokens purchased has been registered already, and there is a backup method to register tokens after the launch. But uh, it's probably safer if you keep it in your own wallet and not on the exchange wallet. That's the best way to make sure. Good to go. Just, just register and, and just register. Yeah. All right. Thanks everyone for coming. All right. Just one more thing. Uh, I'm doing another meetup. Oh. Snap. Okay. I was. Um, I'm doing another meetup sometime next week uh, in the Block Cafe or the week after that. Just go to meetup.com, search EOS Lisbon, and you find a meetup page. And if you're up, it's, it's going to be a more technical one. We go into like the um, account structures, uh, how the how the parallelizing transactions work, actions handlers, a little bit more technical stuff. So if you're interested, uh, keep an eye on meetup.com. Thanks.
doing CJF? Can you set my fire yards? Yeah, man. Just go there. I'll say, yeah. Okay. It's actually. Yeah, it's an open price as well. It's like $12. Is it? Yeah. It's like $20. Where can you buy it, though? Because I'm not thinking that. Where can you buy it? You can buy it on.